encouraged and like to get some help, don't you? Brother Alan Brooks, come and preach for us, and uh, I do appreciate his friendship, and uh, I hope you'll listen closely and let the Lord uh, and his presence encourage you tonight. God bless you, sir. It is a joy to be here. Of course, the older I get, I'm glad to be anywhere, amen? Uh, somebody asked me the other day, said, how you doing? I said, I'm upright, and they're not kicking dirt on me, so I'm okay. I'm still with you, but it is a joy to serve the Lord, and can I say, uh, I really enjoyed myself. I had a lot of things to do. I've been down at the courthouse every day dealing with things. Uh, uh, Judge Lincoln has just been over backwards to help, and the secretaries in the courthouse, because I was dealing with something with my grandfather and the land and so forth, and and uh, really, really had a good time with him. But a lot of that was laid because of your pastor and his son's relationship in community. We all make connections, folks. And though they may not be exactly where we are, that connection helps. And uh, God uses that. And uh, we had a kindred spirit, brother, pastor, or pastor, I'm so used to that, Judge Lincoln and I, because when I answered the phone and uh, we started talking, he said, Roll Tide, brother. And uh, I said, Roll Tide to you too, brother. But anyway, we, uh, he is an Alabama fan. And, and by the way, so am I. And I'm supposed to tease Aaron about that because uh, Aaron gives him a hard time about Arkansas Razorbacks. And probably if I had a number two team, it would be Arkansas because Mama and everybody else from Arkansas and so forth. Um, and... Uh, but I was going to ask Aaron if he would possibly sing the song Jesus Saves with special emphasis on the second verse where it says, wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Of course, we are washed in the crimson flow. But anyway, we'll move right along here. It's a, it is a joy to be, be with you. But I appreciate the friendship. And, and it is true. I said this Sunday night, and I mean this with all my heart. Sometimes I'm closer to my Christian friends than I am to personal family as far as getting along and getting things done. I didn't know your pastor. We've texted a few times, we've called, but we have a, um, there's, we, we have the same family. Yeah, now we, we do happen to have the same last name, amen, but, I, but we're in the same family, the family of God. Amen. And that means that uh, I don't care where you go around the world, and God is my witness, I've had the privilege because of his grace to travel many, many places. And they may not look the same. Their faces may be very dark. Their hair may be different. Their language may be different. But when we begin to communicate on a godly level, they're just brothers and sisters in Christ that I'm going to spend eternity with one day. Uh, and uh, I just, I'm so happy uh, to uh, be serving the Lord and to meet folks that, you know, one day we, we don't get to spend a lot of time together here on this side, but one day we'll get to spend a whole lot more time together up in heaven. We won't be in any hurry then. Uh, we're, we we got to work now for the night cometh when no man can work. And it's good to see the folks going to Dominica. They need to get right and go to Southeast Asia, but no, I'm teasing. But uh, I got to meet them at candidate school, got to host them and sit with them in a meal and so forth and uh, help us get them out of Arkansas, you, you, you know, help us get them out of, of the country. Now, but uh, they need your help. Uh, to, they're faith missionary, just trusting God to supply and to do whatever God would lead them to do. And uh, I just hope and pray that you'll be a part. Do pray for the Papua New Guinea project. I could talk. I'm getting old, so I have a habit of talking too long about Stories, I could tell you stories how God has worked. I mean, can you imagine the privilege of standing in front of 1,200 Muslim children, putting a Bible into their hand and giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ in pure... Un I remember one time at a school, the, mo the, the mullah, the, the head man, was quite upset when we were there, but we had government permission to be there, and he couldn't stop me. And I'm a little bit of a bigger guy than most of those folks are anyway, you know, and so... I, I, I just was pushed my weight around a little bit if I could because I had the, the privilege to be there. And he started standing at the door, and we never make a child take a Bible, but he would glare at the little Muslim kids as they go to start to reach for the Bible. He'd glare at them. And I saw that when it first started. So I told one of the other guys, he said, you, 
the other Bibles. I got something to do. And I said, come here a minute. And I took him out of there real fast and started talking to him about why. Because he was intimidating the kids. He did not want them to get the word of God. And uh, so I started questioning him about a lot of stuff. I'll never forget one meal with a Muslim man. He says, how many wives do you have? I said, excuse me? He says, how many wives do you have? I said, just one. I said, that's the Bible says. He says, oh, Muhammad, blessing and peace be upon him, tells us we can have four wives. He says, and you know why you American men should have more than one wife? Because George Bush is getting all your men killed over in the Mideast. And I thought, I've heard George Bush blame for a lot of things in my life, but I've never heard him blame for not having enough wives for us as men. But he, he, he led into me. But then I got him. I turned to him. I said, by the way, how many do you have? Uh, I only have the one. I said, you know why you only have one? Because she wouldn't put up with you. He had brought another one in. But anyway, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I've heard a lot of things. But the privilege to give them the gospel. I remember one school specifically. It was one of the first schools we went to. Ba Sangam, uh, Ba is the name of a city. It's not hard to spell. B A Ba, kind of like the Bible word A I. You know, the where uh, Joshua went to A I. Well, this city was Ba B A, and Ba Sangam, which is a large Hindu school, over 450 to 500 Hindu uh, students. They all brought their chairs out and sat down. We saw the picture. They were in the white and pink uniforms. The rain started to come in. We were outside. The headmaster was sitting up at the front with us, and we brought chairs out, and he turned to one of our national pastors, Brother Lai, and he said, tell him to quit. The children will get wet. Tell him to quit. Brother Lai looked at him and said, no, you watch. He'll pray, and God will stop the rain. I had no idea this was going on back there, and I've never done this in my life and never felt led before, but I said, and I, we're talking in a Hindu school, folks. The only Christians were the couple pastors that I was standing up at the front. I said, young people, let's bow our heads. I'm going to pray. And I asked God if he'd be glorified, he'd show himself strong, and would he stop the rain? And God is my witness. The rain stopped. We gave out all the Bibles. When the last Bible was given out, it started to sprinkle again. We were going down the road a little bit later. There were two young people walking down the road. We could see their uniforms because most kids in other countries of the world all wear uniforms to school of some sort. And I... We saw them on the side of the road, and we pulled over and said, hey, were you in such and such a school? They said, yes. I said, and one of our men, Don Arnold, said, what did you think of what happened? These were her words. I'll never forget it. She says, we know now that the Christian God is far more powerful than the Hindu God. For when he prayed, his God stopped the rain. Something happened in that school I'd never seen before. Now, brother, we grew up in independent Baptist churches. You go preach someplace. It's not as popular as it used to be, but it used to be real popular. You'd go up and you'd get the preacher to sign your Bible. You know, put his name in there, put a Bible verse. and That was a big deal back in the 70s and 80s and so forth. And everybody signed the Bible. And that was kind of a, a thing you did as a young person in church. Well, we're, we speak at that school. God stopped the rain. Oh, by the way, you know why I think the rain stopped? It wasn't because of my prayer, because I'll be uh, extremely honest with you. I had no faith. I was scared to death, and I thought, what am I doing asking this? But I think it was young Lai, that national pastor, when he said to that headmaster, you watch, he'll pray, God will stop it. I think it was his faith more than anything else. But that, at the end of the service, they came up to me and they'd say, in, their, in, in broken English, would I sign their Bible? I thought, what am I, an independent Baptist church? It's a Hindu school. And I'm signing Bibles. All of our preachers, we're all signing Bibles, putting a Bible verse down. I turned to National. What's going on? He said, they watched a miracle, and they want to document it to prove that it happened. God works in these things. Could you imagine to be called up by the minister of education of a country and say, please help us put God and the Bible in schools? Amen. Would to God it happen in our country? I mean, when are we going to wake up? Amen. We can't even decide. No, I can, but some folks can't decide what bathroom to go to. I heard a preacher the other day said, you know, he said that guys come in there saying, well, you know, you can choose your bathroom. He said, you better choose the right one or we're going to need a whole lot more handicap stalls. <laughs> is what he said. <laughs> but, I mean, we can't even choose that right now. And we call them the heathen. Come on, hello. Amen. But thank God they want to turn to the word of God and in that way. And so pray for us, please.
I'll keep your pastor updated. I, I try to bug him every once in a while. I think I got things kind of settled, but if you think about it, it's not a huge deal. God knows it, and I'm, I'm, I'm a faith missionary. I have support just like these dear folks are trying to gain. When you're a director, you're an eternal deputation because a lot of folks drop you and the churches change or things like that. And, uh, but my mama left us that land, and if it, it, it would sell, it would greatly help because nobody buys my airplane tickets. Nobody buys my, uh, my gas most of the time driving around. We do all of it ourselves, even to the point in the office at BIMI. I'm not paid by BIMI. They don't have any money. We, we, we supply our own desks, our own chairs, our own computers, our own paper, everything, and we live by faith. And I understand this. Everything I have is because of God's people, and I know that, and I'm thankful for it. But would you pray, number one, that God would help our support level? We desperately need it, just like these dear folks do. They want to get to the field. And then number two, God's put us together because of my granddaddy and his land out there that if God so fit to sell it, it would be a blessing to us. If he doesn't, there's a reason he wants us to keep it then and so forth. And uh, But whatever God's will is, I just pray it would be done and pray that God's will would be done in that. Um, I think I know what I want him to do, but you know what? I've learned a long time ago, I pray amiss sometimes. Amen? I don't always know exactly how to ask for things because I think I know everything sometimes. But I've learned greatly, like... One of our candidate presidents for candidates going to learn that you don't know everything and that you do have to humble yourself before a holy God once in a while. Amen. But uh, um, we just need to pray about that. Like your preacher, I appreciate his message, his courage to preach what he preached Sunday night. That was a blessing. Just I wanted to go home. But anyway, Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter number 1. Um, for you that weren't here, you'll live in ignorance. But anyway, Ezra chapter 1. I want to tell you a little story about how I came about this sermon. Uh, preacher knows this is true, that every sermon has its own making, if you will. God begins to work something into your heart and life, and you begin to develop it. And some people say, well, how long did you work on that sermon? Well, let's see, I've been saved 43 years. That's about how long I've been working on it, because it's, it's a life thing that you begin to learn and to, to live. My wife and I were traveling one time, and as so often is, uh, we were put into a hotel, and it was what I call, and this dear brother knows, he'll learn it if he doesn't know it, it was what I call a dead night, meaning between meetings. When you're off somewhere else, too far to get home, but don't have a meeting, you got to find your else some, some place to stay. Now, some churches have what we call prophet chambers. I like to call them prophet dungeons. But nothing spookier than a church at night by yourself. I don't care who you are. Nothing spookier. I think the demons come in when we leave. Amen. And I'll turn every light on in the place and just stand there and the whole place creaks and makes noises. But we were in a hotel and I was tired. I'd driven a long distance and I got into this hotel. I don't know if Super 8 or something. They left the light on for me or somebody. But we got in there and uh, I got settled in. And my wife likes to watch, and, and please, I know too many of them are gay, and I don't like that part, but she loves to watch HGTV because she loves to sit and tell me what things I could do at our house and fix at our house. And I want to sit and say, sweetheart, these are professionals. They don't do that in a half-hour show, you know, uh, and, and it takes them forever sometimes to do those things, but she gets all these ideas for me to go home and do. And so we don't have regular TV at our house, and so... She likes to watch that occasionally to get ideas. And so she was watching it, and I thought, I don't want to watch this. I, I'll hear about I'll hear the whole story anyway a little later. I decided to uh, get my Bible out and read. Well, I looked around and realized I had left my Bible in the car. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail, but I wasn't ready to run outside anymore. I was in the motel room wanting to stay there, amen? I'd gotten comfortable in the motel room, and, uh, and, I, and I thought, well... Oh, what can I do? And I looked around. Thank God I live in America. I looked over and there was a Gideon Bible sitting in a, on top of a thing. Now, the well, interesting thing about it was the Gideon Bible was open to Ezra chapter 1. And I thought that was a little odd that it was open to that. Most of the time they're closed. Now, I go over to foreign countries. I've been in Indonesia and India, the two largest Muslim countries in the world. And in most of those hotels, there's a Quran. And then on the ceiling, there's an arrow. You know what that arrow is? It's which way is Mecca. 
That's literally what it is. It's an arrow on the ceiling of the hotel room that tells you which way is Mecca so you can pray to Mecca. Now what I do is I get a chair and turn it around. But anyway, uh, um, I looked and there was that Gideon Bible sitting there. And so I walked over and I picked it up and I thought, now it's funny that it's open to Ezra. Now folks, please listen to me very carefully. I believe you ought to have a systematic plan of Bible study and Bible reading. I believe you ought, and now, by the way, God is not impressed with speed reading. You don't have to sit and read 20 chapters a day and sit and say, I got it through, tick it off. No, if it's only half a chapter, that's as long as you are reading it and trying to muse on it or meditate on it and let God teach you. Now, I don't think you ought not, you know, get stuck forever in one place, but read. Like, I personally have a habit. I'll take 10 chapters a day, and I read those 10 chapters every day for, the, for one week. The same 10 chapters every day, like right today I've read Jeremiah chapter 11 through Jeremiah chapter 20, and I read them every day for a week. You know what, by the end of the week, you pretty well know Jeremiah 11 through 20, okay? And, and through that way, and that's just something I've done. I used to just read from Genesis to Revelation. I've done many different plans. One of the worst plans you can do is just to flop your Bible open and read, okay? That's one of the worst. Because you'll never know what you're going to get. And you, you've all heard the story, if you've been in church, the guy that did it, and it said Judas went out and hung himself. He said, well, no, I don't like that one. So he closed his Bible, flopped it back down, went like that, and he said, what thou do? No, he said, go thou and do likewise. He said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. So he closed his Bible again, flopped it down, put it, and he says, what thou doest, do quickly. He realized that's not a good way to read your Bible, okay? So please, I'm not saying that just flop it open and read anywhere. You ought to have a plan. God is a very ordered person or deity. But I saw it sitting there on Ezra, and I said, Lord, okay, I'm going to read Ezra. I don't know why it's there. I'm going to read it. And I began to read Ezra. Now, I'm a missionary. I'm a preacher. And can I confess something? You're always looking for sermons when you're a preacher. Now, I do want, and one of the hardest things to discern as a preacher is what is God speaking to my heart about specifically or what does he want me to preach specifically? Because sometimes I've gotten confused where God was trying to teach Alan Brooks something that I hadn't really learned well enough to tell anybody else yet. But I was reading, and I started reading Ezra chapter 1. And if you're there, listen to it, please. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. So now, I'll give you a little tip on studying. First question is who? Cyrus. Well, who is Cyrus? If you'll remember that Nebuchadnezzar was king at one time and then his grandson was uh, the one that where the handwriting came on the wall and the Medes and the Persians took over and conquered the kingdom. Cyrus was one of the kings, the Persian king. And he's now in power. And the Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto him under the, from the mouth of Jeremiah. Now, I know we're reading Ezra, but in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25, Jeremiah chapter 29, God used Jeremiah to prophesy that the nation of Israel would go into captivity for 70 years. And so God used that to teach him this. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many kings do you know just sit down and start reading Jeremiah? And I started thinking, well, how did he start reading Jeremiah? Then, if you got your Bibles, turn over a few pages to Daniel chapter 1. I think I want to show you something. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is now in chapter 1. We know he's the one that uh, said, uh, I'll not eat the, uh, the, the king's meat. I'll not defile myself. And he has some buddies there. I like to call them Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. That is their Jehovah name, their godly name. We usually refer to them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that, that was their heathen name. But in Daniel chapter 1, look down in verse 21, and it says, And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Who taught Cyrus? The book of Jeremiah. Daniel did. did. You know, Daniel as a teenager when he decided not to defile himself had no idea that one day he would be used of God 
to teach a king to help the people come back to the country of, of, of uh, Israel. He continued, and that's one of the things about you stay right with God and you'll just do what God wants you to do and God will put you in the places he wants you to be. But he taught him that and he said, God, the spirit stirred up Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation. And it also says, and it went on to all the kingdom and he also put it in writing. And the first thing I thought of, you know what? God's made a proclamation in this blessed book. And he's put it in writing. Now, what was the proclamation? Verse number 2. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me. What is it God charged him to do? Build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. God had stirred up Cyrus and said, I want you, Cyrus, to be instrumental in building the house of God back in Jerusalem. Wow. And then I got to thinking, what does a missionary do? See, a missionary in reality, there's a lot of folks that call themselves missionaries, but a missionary in reality goes to a country, evangelizes people, teaches those people, and helps to plant a local New Testament church which we often refer to as the house of God. In reality, we're the temple of God. But we plant a local New Testament church because sometimes a missionary can't stay in that country, but the national can. And Jesus said, I'll build my church till the gates of hell won't prevail against it. I will build my church. So a mission, and by the way, one of my tests as a pastor was I wanted missionaries that were involved in church planting. Why? I want them to work themselves out of a job to go plant a church so that they could do. Did you know Hudson Taylor, when he went to China, had a 75-year plan to start churches and leave China? He didn't plan on staying there the rest of his life. He wanted to set it up so that they would do it one day. But he said, I might make a proclamation. I'm going to put it down in writing. Go back and build the house of God in Jerusalem. And you know what? I got to thinking God has given us a proclamation. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he's given us a proclamation to build the house of God. Build up and plant churches so that folks can be saved. And, that's the pro and he put it in writing just like this. Now let's go on. Then he asked a question in verse number 3. Who is there among you of all his people, his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. But he asks a haunting question. Who is there among you, among the people? Let him go up to Jerusalem and do it. What is he asking? Who's going to go? How many will go? You know, that's what I do as a director. I travel over and over again. And I ask young people. I had the privilege of speaking to the your master's club back in the back before we came in here I told him about Darlene Rose Darlene Rose died not long ago she was a missionary first white woman to go in Erin Jaira was captured by the Japanese during World War II tortured her husband was killed tremendous lady of God she was a 12 year old little girl in Boone Isle when she sat on the back row and said God I'll be a missionary she said I'll go she didn't know what God was leading her to do God still asks that question today. Who'll go? Who'll go? I was a pastor in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You did to get that, Aaron, didn't you? Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They need missionaries, though, right? But anyway, I was a pastor in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. A town of 105,000 people at that time. 65 Baptist churches, 15 of them independent Baptist churches, a myriad of Church of God, Assembly of God. Every, every, you know, it's a typical southern town, a church on every corner. During a mission conference, Brother Bob Dayton was preaching, and God spoke to my heart, and God said, Alan, anybody can do what you're doing, but not everybody will go out of country. You know what? The Lord spoke to my heart and said, will you go? I'm asking that question tonight. Now, he put some requirements on those that go. Verse 3, his God be with him. There ought to be the obvious evidence of the presence of God in your life before you can ever go be a missionary God wants you to be. 
The presence of God should be there. Why do you think Joseph could survive and not get bitter and angry and all the women? Because the Lord was with him, it complete said. The Lord was with him. The presence of Almighty God in your life. And by the way, the early church in the book of Acts, when they called out the first missionaries, uh, Barnabas and Saul in those early days, it was obvious the church saw that God was in them to do that work. And by the way, that's one of the ways we know and sometimes pastors even know they can look at young people and say, you know what, God's going to use that person. God's on them. God's in. It, God be with them. Number two, I think they need the power of God. Look at verse five. It says, then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all of them whose spirit God hath raised. Not only did they have the presence of God, I think they ought to have the power of God in their life. The power of God where God is doing something in their life. And then also, I think, they ought to have the passion of God. Burning desire. I mean, extreme ownership. Be like Cortez in the old days when he brought his Spanish to the shores. Get them off the boat and burn the boats and said, Gentlemen, the only path we have is forward and victory. We have nowhere else to go. The passion for what we're doing. And you know what, there's something about my grandfather who was a preacher in this area years and years ago. He used to say, you know what, if you want people right here and they're over here, you've got to stand over here to try to move them that far. They'll never always go as far as you go. But you've got to be a fanatic. Be passionate about what you believe. Be passionate about what you're doing and believe in it. And it's interesting, you know, all these people have been taken captive all of Israel's down in captivity. They've been there 70 years. There's thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them. But in, De in Ezra chapter 2, we won't take the time to read it, only 49,927 people said, I'll go. Now, I don't mean this wrong, but if I was in captivity in a foreign land and I was given the opportunity by the king to go back to my homeland, I think I'd say, I'll go. Come on. But not all of them wanted to go. That bothers me, doesn't it? It bothers me when children of God who call themselves children of God are more contented in this world than in the world to come. And that's exactly what happened there. Now notice what he says, though. Verse 4. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth. It's an interesting word, sojourneth. I've learned in my... 61 years of life and all my years is preaching that a lot of folks read their old King James Bible and they come across a word they don't sure what it means and they just read over it and keep going. Uh, there's, Brother Roloff used to say, Dr. Brother Lester Roloff used to say one of the best commentaries on the Bible is the Bible. And number two, one of the best things you can do to interpret the Bible is a good old-fashioned Webster's Dictionary. Amen? Just an old... Now, and they didn't say Google it either. It's just an old, I like, I'm old school. Some people say, well, I like Facebook. Well, I like to put my face in the book, not face. But anyway, uh, uh, but they, they, to look up words. You know what the word sojourn means? To travel through. And what he's saying is, whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth. They're remaining in a place they're supposed to be traveling through. You see that? And children of God, listen to me, please. We're, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Can I get an amen right there? And I'm going to make a statement, and I know some of you are going to disagree with me, and it's all right. I'm an American. I love the, the flag. Do you have one in here? Oh, took it to the back for the thing. I love the flag. I still get goosebumps. When the flag goes by and the thing, I'm an American, but can I say something? I am a child of God first. And I'm going to make this statement. Please don't misinterpret it. I, I stand for our soldiers. I stand, my son is a policeman. I think blue lives matter very deeply. But you know what? Sometimes we're more patriotic than we are Christian even, if we're not careful. Paul was, if you remember, God had to always work on Paul to quit going to the Jews. He said, go to the Gentiles, go to the Gentiles, go to the Gentiles. He said, I want to go to the Jews, go to the Gentiles. And I, I'm patriot. I'm for patriotism. Please don't misinterpret that. But our home is elsewhere. 
We are all foreign missionaries if you're a child of God. Just many churches have a little sign when they walk out the back door, sir, you are now entering the mission field. This is a little bit of the heavenlies, like uh, Ephesians talks about. A little bubble we get to come into, get fired up, get charged up, and we all go out into the mission field because this world is not our home. Don't get so earthly minded we're no heavenly good. Most of us are not in danger of getting too heavenly minded we're no earthly good. Most of it's the reverse of that. Amen? But he, he said now, whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, look what he said. Let the men of his place, what's the next two words? Help him. Can I give an illustration here? This dear brother and his dear wife want to go to Dominican Republic they've said Lord I'll go now I'm not saying you don't want to go but God hasn't specifically put on your heart to go okay but since God has you remaining here what should we do with a couple like that and they're just they just happen to be here we should help them can I get an amen let him that remaineth in any place where he sojourned, let the men of his place help him with what? With silver, with his gold, and with his goods, with his beasts. Can we put it in modern language? Money, his beasts, that's how he travels, his car, how he gets to some place. Besides the free will offering for the house of God. This is above the tithe. This is it. Now, there's a free will offering for the house of God we're supposed to give. Now, I know I'm a stranger and you don't know me. Then I've gone into where angels fear to go right here. But the tithe belongs unto the Lord. Amen? Right. But above that, though, we're supposed to help them that are willing to go. Amen. That's what he says. Besides the free will offering for the house of God. Notice what it says. Uh, oh, look, jump over to chapter 2 and verse 69. And they gave after their ability under the treasure of the work there three score and one hundred thousand drams of gold and they list all of it and they did it chapter 3 verse 1 at the end it says together as one man to Jerusalem they teamed up they partnered they said God hasn't called us to go but we will help them we will strengthen their hands as they do go I'm sitting there I'm sitting in that hotel my wife's over there figuring out how I'm gonna redo cabinets or something I'm sitting there having a spell because I thought there is missions but you know what I'm going to show you one more thing in missions look down in verse number well let's read verse 6 and all they that were about them strengthened their hands with the vessels of silver and gold and goods and with beasts and precious things besides that was willingly offered now look at verse 7 also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord with which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and had put them in the house of his gods, even those did Cyrus the king of Persia bring forth by the hand, and he lists all the... He said, you know what I think happens? Please listen to me. These guys said, Lord, we'll go. The guys that were going to remain there said, we're going to help. And Cyrus, the proclaimer, said, you know what, I want to get involved in that. I want to do something. Go get those vessels that were taken by Nebuchadnezzar out of the house of God. Bring that involved. When we do what we're supposed to do in obedience, and we do what we're supposed to do in obedience here, God wants to step in and do things over and above what we could either possibly think or dream. The proclaimer, the one that wrote it down said, I want to get involved. One of my favorite preachers was an old gentleman by the name of Raymond Hancock. Raymond Hancock was just an old leather lung southern preacher. He told a story one time about when he was pastoring and he was going through some rough times. He said he left his office, went for a walk. He just walking down the street. He said he had to get his head cleared. As he walked down the street, he saw an interesting sight. He saw a bunch of ants, and please ladies don't get upset, but they were carrying an old roach. You know, and the roach had its road gear up. It was dead. And they were carrying that roach to wherever ants carry roaches. They were carrying that roach. He said, and I thought of the verse in Proverbs where it says, Consider the ant, thou sluggard. And he said, So I sat there and I watched him for a little while. I didn't want to go back to the office. I was thinking of all the burdens. He said, I looked down there, 
And he said, I got so tickled. He said, that's just like my church. He said, there's a whole lot of ants running in circles around about 10. We can't do it. 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 There's others that are even standing on top of the roach talking about how they can't do this. But there were a few under the burden of that roach carrying it. Huh? Come on. He said, now, most of them were all running around just talking about it. But there were a few carrying the burden of that roach. He said, they were going along, and finally they came to a curb. He said, that was the most interesting thing I'd ever... I watched them. He said, they started straight up the edge of that curb with that roach. They got a portion of the way up, and the roach fell down to the ground. And he said, I knew it just like in church. Some of them left. Because they said, well, we knew it couldn't be done anyway. And they left. Others said, you know, we need to think about this. The deacons all got together. No, I, don't, I mean, the men all got together. The ants all got together. Started reevaluating re it. Then finally they said, well, well, let's try it again. Some of them got back under the burden. They said, he said, I watched them three times try to get thing, that thing up the curb and fail every time. He said, finally, I knew I needed to get back to the office. They tried one more time. And they were fighting it. Oh, they were pushing. They were about, about three quarters to seven eighths of the way up there. And he said, I could tell it's about to fall again. He said, I just had to. I took my pen and I reached down and I flipped it up over that curb. Woo! He said, they had a Pentecostal spell running back and forth, those ants did, because they made it up over the curb. And he said, you know, sometimes we get under the burden and we do all that we can do we come to the end of ourselves God reaches down and puts us over the top Amen. just when we need it the most just when we need it and that's what Silas did the proclaimer provided for him I love to travel to India and I'll close with this and India is one of the most amazing countries to me in the world you can see everything you can order a computer and have it delivered to you on an ox cart and I mean that sincerely. It's one of the most amazing countries in the world. But the story is told. I've had the privilege of going to uh, the Summer Palace in Mysore, southern India. It's unbelievable. The doors made of rosewood carved. The men that carved them had their hands cut off so they could never carve anything like that again. There were silver doors that were made. There was a marble floor that had embedded in it emeralds, diamonds, and gold, and that's where they danced, where they walked over it, walked all over it. Unbelievable. You have to take your shoes off. You have to walk through that place to look at all of it. The story is told that one day there was a beggar out in front of the, the palace. He would stand with his little bowl, and he would cry out, Rice! Rice, please! And by the way, if you've ever been to India, you know there are beggars everywhere trying to get something from you. Some of them even will blind their children. Some of them will cut off a leg or an arm just to get them to look more simple. And some of them will hire out babies to stand on the middle of the street with a baby on their hip to try to get you to give to them because they're begging all the time. The little beggar stood there crying, Rice! Rice! As he stood there, suddenly he saw the dust coming from a distance, an entourage was coming, mighty elephants. He realized the Raja himself was coming down that pathway and he thought, surely today what good fortune, today I will have rice. The, the Maharaja is coming himself. Finally the mighty elephant comes along and with, a, with, with one of its handlers poking it along there it stops. Haya, haya, and down the elephant comes. Off the side of the elephant comes the Maharaja. He walks up to the, to the little beggar standing there, the beggar as best he could, says, Rice, please, rice, rice. The Maharaja looked at him and said, Do you have any rice for the Raja? The beggar thought, What are you asking me? Rice for the Raja? He's filthy rich. But you don't argue, because, I mean, your head's taken off immediately. <laughs> All right. Do you have any rice? For the Raja. Finally, the beggar looked into his little bowl and found three little emaciated pieces of rice. He picked those three pieces of rice up and he handed them to the Maharaja. The Maharaja took the rice, handed them to his servant, took a little leather bag, opened that bag, pulled out three pieces of gold. 
dropped it into the bowl, got on the elephant and started to leave. The beggar looked down and said, why? Why didn't I give him at all of it? Why did I give him so little? One day in heaven, my dear friend, we get to heaven, we'll wish we had given him more. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for these good folks, this dear pastor. Please, speak to our hearts as only you could do. Lord, you've given the proclamation. You've put it down in writing. You've asked the question, who will go? And maybe there's somebody here tonight that's saying, I'm willing to go. Others have not been called, and they should feel no guilt. But they should say, then I'm willing to help those who are going. And I know, dear Lord, when we do what we should do, it frees you to do what you want to do, to, to, to reach in and put us over the top. Help us to give it our all. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Pastor, would you come, please? You stand, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'd like to come and pray and just thank the Lord for what you have and maybe ask Him about what you could give or do or who you could pray for or who, who you could help. We're called to walk in love. And we help those who are trying to get the gospel out. I believe that's showing love, don't you? Let me ask you a question. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Uh, would it be anybody who would say, you know, preacher, I'm not saved, but I'd like to be. Anybody like that? You'd lift your hand. I'm not saved, but I'd like to be. I'll pray for you if you just lift your hand. Maybe somebody says, you know, I think God was tugging at my heart tonight about missions. I, I think I might be called. Anybody like that? Why don't you come and pray about it? Let us know if we can pray with you. Maybe there's someone who says, you know, I've never been uh, scripturally baptized. I've been saved, but I'm not scripturally baptized. I'd like to be baptized. Would you come? Just step out, walk right down front, and we'll talk about it. Or maybe you believe this was the church where God would have you to serve as a member. You believe God's moved 